Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we'll take a look at how multiple processes can actually communicate with each other in order to solve problems that are easier solved when you have more than one process. So let's revisit processes in operating systems again. We know that processes can interact with each other. So for example, when they have to share or want to share resources, they have to wait for another, so they have to perform synchronization. And we can also have these processes exchange data so they can operate on joint data sets and that's communication, obviously. So we've seen that waiting mechanisms are required in order to enable controlled communication. So uh, to define certain orders to access shared resources, and we've also seen that waiting mechanisms can be problematic because they can lead to deadlocks. What we did not take a close look at so far is the data exchange between processes. We've only seen that uh, for light and featherweight processes, uh, there is a, well, a shared address space between these, so they can actually uh, exchange data by just putting it in one memory location and another lightweight or featherweight process or thread can read data from that location. And we've seen several methods to ensure integrity of data there. For example, using atomic instructions or semaphores as we've seen in a previous lecture. So what's inter-process communication? So when we use inter-process communication, we want to create a software system in which multiple processes cooperate on one task. And usually when they do this, they simultaneously have to access information that's shared between these processes operating on that task. Uh, why do we do this? Well, on the one hand, we have multiple processors or in some cases, multiple computers working on a task. So if we can do things in parallel, we can reduce the processing time to uh, complete a task or we could hide processing times due to background execution. So essentially we could delegate a task to just run in the background, so not as an application taking up your screen. And uh, well, uh, we can wait until it's finished and do something else in the foreground. So there are two different ways to exchange uh, information or data between processes. One of the approaches is to use messages here. So messages are items of information that are exchanged between processes, like sending a letter, uh, which do not require any shared memory. Uh, whereas you can also communicate using shared memory. And this, uh, like with threads uh, or featherweight processes, this means that we exchange data by uh, writing into a memory location and another process can read out of that memory location. So we have a common shared memory area which is uh, distributed among all the processes that collaborate on a certain task. And as we've seen, synchronization is very important when we consider shared memory uh, communication approaches. So message-based communication uh, is pretty simple. In general, it's based on two primitives. So we have two functions, a send function here. So a send function gets two parameters, a destination, so who is going to be the receiver of my message and of course the message itself uh, whereas a receive function uh, does the opposite so it tells us okay we want to receive a message here so we'll provide a buffer or a pointer uh, to a message buffer to this receive operation and we can also tell our system from which source we are actually planning to receive a message of course, these are just two names, so uh, real implementations can have similar names, which have more or less the same functionality. So different implementation of message-based communication can differ in the way they do synchronization between sender and receiver. Uh, they uh, can employ different methods for addressing stations or processes on uh, your inter-process communication system. So they have different ways of addressing the communication partners and possibly a number of other properties as we'll see in a bit. So synchronization for message-oriented communication is uh, almost as important as for shared memory communication. So uh, message-oriented communication leaves us with a number of different alternatives. 
So uh, we need synchronization when sending messages, and we might also need synchronization when receiving messages. And there's two ways to do this. On the one hand, we can do something which is called synchronous message passing, or also called rendezvous, uh, which means that uh, whenever a receiver plans to re receive a message, it calls a receive call, and this receive call doesn't return immediately, but the receive call actually waits until a message has arrived. Potentially a message with the given parameter. So for example, we say we don't want any arbitrary message to be delivered, but only a message by sender XYZ. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with synchronous message passing, the sender also blocks until the reception of the message is confirmed. So what happens is that a receiver wants to receive a message. A sender, at some point in time, sends this message to the receiver, but the sender doesn't immediately return after it has tried sending the message. But the sender waits until it received some information back from the receiver. And this information is just a confirmation that the message has been received, or maybe a negative confirmation uh, that there was some problem with the message, for example, uh, whatever incorrect parameters or a problem in data transmission or and so on so then the sender can try again so this is a synchronous way to do message passing which has yeah implicit synchronization because none of the sender or receiver can proceed until this communication process of sending one message and sending the confirmation back has been completed on the other hand, there is asynchronous message passing, which means that a sender simply hands the message to the operating system and then continues doing something else, so it continues running. Uh, whereas a receiver uh, can wait or cannot wait, it depends on the implementation, so blocking is always optional on both sides for asynchronous message passing. So uh, what's the difference in implementation between synchronous and asynchronous message passing? Now, for synchronous message passing, there's always just one message outstanding because the sender can't continue with uh, executing its program until the reception of that one message has been received. As a consequence, for synchronous message passing, the sender is unable to send another message while it's waiting for the confirmation of the reception of the previous message. So this means we don't need any buffering in the operating system because for each sender or a sender-receiver pair, there's only one message as we call it, in flight, uh, whereas in asynchronous message passing, a sender just hands the message to the operating system. So you can compare it in real life. You write a letter and you throw it away in your mailbox, uh, and then you can write the next letter and throw it away in your mailbox and don't have to wait for a letter back from a recipient that tells you, oh, I received your letter, thank you. Uh, so obviously this uh, might enable you to do other things in between. Uh, in turn, this of course re requires buffering. So in the postal system, buffering happens in the system, so the letters are stored somewhere and they're, they're delivered. In an operating system, the operating system provides the infrastructure, so the operating system has to provide a number of buffers in order to enable processes to just send a message and then go on doing other things, maybe send more messages and so on. So very often, this uh, synchronization is implemented as asynchronous message passing with potentially blocking send and receive operations in case for send that uh, there is no free buffer available and in case of receive that there is no message that has arrived so far. Now the next thing we need to concern uh, be concerned about is addressing. So if we have multiple communication partners uh, the question is, how do we indicate to our system with which communication partner we actually want to exchange information? So for message-oriented communication, we can have direct addressing. For example, uh, when we use signals, we'll talk about signals in a moment, we can directly use process IDs because we know, at least as long as a process ID is not reused, a process ID is always unique in the system, so we know that as long as the process exists, it won't change its process ID. So as a consequence, we can simply use this process ID, which, which is just a positive integer number, to send information to that specific process to address this specific process. Um, there can also be more complex ways of addressing. 
For example, if a process uh, can have uh, multiple communication channels, we could have some dedicated communication endpoints of a process, which might be called a port or a socket. So this means a process, in addition to its process ID, has some in additional information and it can say whatever data on uh, topic A comes in over port uh, X and data on topic B can come in over port Y. Uh, we can also have indirect addressing in communication systems for message-oriented communication. Uh, so we can have something we call channels or pipelines or simply pipes or also call, uh, some uh, approaches called mailboxes or message queues and we give details on both of these in the uh, rest of this lecture. Now there can also be an additional dimension when we consider addressing and this is group addressing. Group addressing is always used when we want to communicate with more than one communication partner. So for example, we want to communicate to a set of processes uh, that uh, whatever a new work package is available, the processes can work on. Or we want to send some information like to, to a number of receivers, like when we're just uh, distributing a lecture over the network to uh, well, a number of students. So. Uh, the usual communication is unicast, so it's a one-to-one -one communication, so one sender sends to exactly one recipient, but a sender can also choose to send to a selection, so to a group of possible recipients, so for example processes uh, with ID 10, 20 and 30, but not all. And finally we can also do broadcasting, so broadcasting means we send a message to all the receivers. Now, what does all mean? Of course, not always all in the world, but all in a certain context. So maybe for all processes on this computer, but it can also mean all computers in our local network and so on. Now, uh, as I said, we also have additional properties for message-oriented communication. And two of the important properties are the message format. So on the one hand, we can have so-called stream-oriented communication. So Data that is exchanged is simply a stream of characters or bytes uh, with no fixed format and uh, whatever. And we can also have message-oriented communication where we have a certain prescribed structure of a message which has to be uh, used by sender and recipient. So messages, especially for message-oriented communication, can have a fixed length but they can, could also have variable lengths depending on your application. And you can also have typed messages. So essentially you can uh, declare a type system over messages to indicate which types of messages are allowed. Or you can be a bit more unstructured and have an unstructured uh, message format for your communication. And finally, we also have to consider transmission of messages. So uh, transmission can be unidirectional. So if we only hand commands to a worker process or to a number of worker process and we don't want any confirmation, we can send uh, messages using unidirectional communication. So there's one sender and one receiver and the sender always see sends only, whereas the receiver always receives only. And we can also have bidirectional communication, uh, which means that uh, both processes or all processes uh, participating in a communication can be a sender and a receiver of messages. In old textbooks, you'll also find the terms half-duplex communication for unidirectional and full-duplex communication for bidirectional communication. Half-duplex means that sender and receiver uh, just take turns in sending and receiving and don't send and receive at the same time. Whereas full-duplex means we always have possible communication in both directions at the same time. Now for transmission, we can also distinguish between reliable and unreliable communication. Uh, so you might wonder why we have unreliable communication or we want to have unreliable communication in computers. Now, for some applications, it's more important that most of the data in a communication arrives on time uh, than that all of the information arrives, uh, well, without any changed bits, but it may arrive late. So, for example, if you're streaming video over a connection, if you uh, figure out that there was some yeah, disturbance in your byte stream of your video and it takes you like a second to uh, correct this dis disturbance. This means you'll have some jitter or stutter in your played video, which is not what you want. You'd rather prefer that like a, a small number of pixels might be disturbed in one frame of your video, but you don't get any stutter. So this is why you have unreliable communication 
for something that goes in bulk, where, for example, timing is more important than the absolute correctness of the contents. Of course, several, especially streaming video formats, are especially uh, yeah, laid out to support small errors, so uh, the receiver process can, for example, continue to set up and play video even if small errors have occurred. Now for transmission, especially if uh, yeah, packet-based transmission, obviously, it's also important if the order is preserved or not preserved. This is obviously important when you do internet connections. So for internet connections, a packet or uh, from sender to receiver can take different ways. So a packet sent later, if it has a faster connection somewhere in between, can overtake a packet that was sent earlier. So packets would arrive in the wrong order. And uh, if we want to actually keep the original order of packets, we need to ensure that the packets are numbered so we can restore the original order. And of course, again, our operating system would need to provide buffer space in order to reorder late arriving packets so they arrive at their correct position in the data stream. So when we want to implement IPC, let's first take a look at local IPC. So local always means we're doing inter-process communication within a single computer or operating system. And one of the most simple cases of inter-process communication we've already talked about briefly are signals in Unix. So signals can be seen as sort of an interrupt which is realized in software. So this works similar to hardware, I.O. interrupts from devices, and this is a very minimalistic form of inter-process communication, since the only thing that's actually transmitted to the receiving process that receives the signal is a number, the number of a signal. So how can this be used in Unix? Well, if the sender wants to send a signal to a process, it uses a system call that is a bit of a misnomer and has a very uh, martial name like it's called kill. But kill not only kills or terminates a process, kill is a general purpose facility for sending signals, including a signal to kill a process. That's where the name comes from. So uh, on the one hand, a process can send a signal to another process to indicate uh, some information that has to be transmitted. But also the operating system itself can send signals to processes when certain events have occurred. Now the receiving process has to decide how to handle these signals when it receives them. And in general, there are three different ways to handle a signal. Now the first thing a process can do for most signals is it can simply choose to ignore them because maybe it doesn't have any way to handle the signal and it decides to just carry on with whatever it was doing. A uh, default uh, way to handle many signals is to actually terminate the process. So that's the worst case assumption because a signal indicates that something out of the ordinary has happened and as a reaction our process is probably unable to continue the way it was doing it before and if it didn't decide to do anything about a signal the operating system just assumes okay the application doesn't know how to continue because it has no code handling the signal so it's safer to terminate that process than to let it continue running with maybe incorrect data or incorrect assumptions and finally uh, what's the usual way uh, if you want to communicate with signals you implement a so-called signal handler function so this is a function you register with the operating system to tell the operating system whenever a signal with a certain name or number essentially arrives for me as a process please make sure that when the signal arrives uh, that a certain function in the process context is executed so like an interrupt this means whenever a signal arrives the current execution of the process is suspended. The operating system forces the process to execute the signal handler by setting a stack up and setting a program counter to the signal handler start address. And then your signal handler is executed. And when you return from the signal handler, like a return from, from an interrupt handler or from a function, the process can then just continue in most cases at the location in its code where it was interrupted uh, when the signal arrived. So using signals, processes can especially be informed about exceptional situations. And some examples for the signals available in Unix are SIGINT. So SIGINT is an interrupt signal, which means that there is a request to terminate the process because it was doing something wrong. And this is the signal that's sent when you press Ctrl C on your keyboard. 
This doesn't immediately kill your process, but it sends a signal to the process asking it, please, please terminate now. And this means when you have a signal handler for SIGINT, the signal handler can take care, for example, of writing buffers that have not been saved to disk, closing files, closing communication channels, and so on. So you have the opportunity to clean up stuff when you receive a SIGINT. A SIG stop is a signal to just suspend the process. So that's what happens when you press Ctrl Z on your keyboard, which means that your process is no longer scheduled but it's not kicked out of scheduling or out of memory. It just is terminal, uh, is, is, uh, yeah, for a short while until you con uh, decide to continue with that process is incapitated. So it cannot do anything, it cannot execute. And uh, we've already seen in a previous lecture that you can then send the process to a background. So if it was running in the foreground or you can choose to continue running your process when you checked uh, that whenever uh, this process was assuming is correct. Uh, there's a number of uh, more exotic signals. So for example, if you have a graphical window system, you still have very many text-based applications on Unix. So uh, you can get a SIG winch, SIG signal for window change, which indicates to your application that the size of your terminal window, for example, has changed. So maybe it's a good idea to redraw your screen because otherwise your screen layout might be maybe scrambled. We have already seen sick child before, so this is a signal that's sent to a process when a child process has terminated. So we can actually have a signal handler for this instead of checking for uh, terminated child processes manually. Uh, and then we have a signal that indicates that we tried to access an invalid memory location. So either because uh, there is no memory mapped at that location or we, for example, have tried to write to a memory location which only had read access. So six segmentation violation or six sec B is memory protection violation. And uh, then there's sick kill. Sick kill is a process that is a, a signal that immediately kills a process without any option to clean up. So if a process is doing something really wrong, like starting to delete your file system, you should probably send it a sick kill signal. For most signals, there's a default handler uh, defined, which is installed by the operating system when the process is started. And depending on the signal, so you can look it up in the signal man page, this can be termination, for example, or suspension. Uh, but for most signals, uh, you can actually redefine this by defining, for example, a signal handler. Details, as I said, are provided in the man page for signal. So here's a logical view of signals in Unix. Uh, we also call this the Hollywood, Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we call you. So the process that is to receive a signal doesn't have to pull the operating system for new signals to arrive, but the operating system takes care of sending a signal to the receiving process. So here we have an example where we have two processes that want to send a signal to one and the same receiving process, and this is using the signal call, uh, the system called kill. So kill, as we've seen, is used to send a certain signal and not to immediately kill the program. So uh, whenever a sending process executes the kill system call, giving a process ID of the receiving process as a parameter and the number of the signal, what happens is when the receiving process is scheduled next, uh, then it's interrupted and it starts, if a signal handler is registered, it starts executing its signal handler here on the right hand side. Now what can happen is that a second process decides to also send a signal to our receiving process while that signal handler is still executing. So for signals, it can happen that a signal handler itself is interrupted by another signal coming in. And so this would mean we would switch to the next signal handler for that new signal coming in from our sending process too. And whenever that signal handler uh, has finished, so we switch over here to that new signal handler. And whenever that signal handler is finished, then we switch first back to our original first signal handler here. And only when that one has finished, we switch back to the original execution of the program that was interrupted initially by our first process sending it a signal. From a logical view, the signaling of a process and the start of the signal handler happen simultaneously. In implementation view, it's a bit different. And we see signal handlers can themselves be interrupted by another signal coming in.
So in a logical view, uh, the sending of a signal and the delivery of a signal take place simultaneously. Now in practice, that doesn't work because we know at least on a single processor system, there's only one process running and to deliver a signal, obviously, the recipient process has to be running, which cannot be the case when a signal is sent to it because then the sender is running. So signal handling always takes place when this process that is a recipient of a signal is reactivated. So especially when execution of that process returns from kernel to user mode. So for example, when that process was in a system call doing IO and in between another process sent a signal to that one, this process that is a recipient receives this uh, signal when it returns, for example, from a read system call. So uh, we have a number of different situations concerning signals. Uh, so when a receiving process is in state running, uh, well, then it usually creates the situation for the signals itself because uh, there is no other process running in a single processor system that could actually have sent a signal. So uh, in running state, signals usually are sent by the operating system when uh, some exceptional situation is detected. For example, the operating system has tried to access an invalid memory location, so it created a segmentation fault or what we call a bus error. So uh, in cases that, uh, when this happens, for example, the MMU signals a hardware exception to the operating system. The operating system then in turn uh, turns this into one of the Unix signals, which is then sent to the running process, which then can execute the signal handler. So this means when a process is running and a signal occurs, its signal handler is immediately started if it is registered. Now, when the receiving process is currently not running, but it's ready. So for example, it's waiting for processor allocation and another process uses the kill syscall to send it a signal. Uh, then we can't deliver it immediately, so we have to store it somewhere. So this signal is recorded in the process control block of the receiving process. And whenever this process is going to be running again, so when it's allocated the CPU, then instead of continuing where it left off, first the signal handler is automatically executed. Now when a process is waiting for I.O., so it's in blocked state here, then uh, what happens is actually because an I.O. syscall may be long running, this syscall can be interrupted and it eventually returns with an error message. And this error is called eInter, so error I was interrupted. Then the process state is set to ready because we know that we shouldn't set it to running immediately from what we've seen about scheduling before. And then we just continue as was ready before. Now, uh, if the system call was interrupted and we try to read something, well, we didn't receive all data, so maybe we want to try to read this data again after we handled the signal. So if required, we can actually choose to re-execute this interrupted system call from the scratch. So we don't set up uh, something to interrupt system calls and continue an interrupting system call, but system calls are always atomic in terms of either they yeah, succeed or they don't. And if they don't because of such an e-interrupt, then we'll have to execute them once more. So this is one reason why you should check for errors in operations like this, because things like these can actually happen in Unix systems. So how are Unix signals used in practice? I uh, show you an example of the uh, Apache web server here. So this is an excerpt from the Apache HTTP server manual. And uh, this is uh, concerned with stopping and restarting the Apache server. And the man page says to send a signal to the parent process, you should issue a command such as kill and then dash term is uh, the indication of the name of the signal you want to send. So term is one of the signals for terminate, as you can imagine. And then you can use this indication to get the process ID of your web server. So the Apache web server stores its own process ID, usually in that file here, httpd.pid. This just contains a number, so the process ID of the currently running web server. And this is stored in some directory, for example, depending on your installation and user local Apache logs. And here it shows three signals that you can send. So a term signal indicates stop now. So it tells the parent web server process, because you can have multiple web server processes running for uh, handling multiple connections at the same time. So sending a term signal causes the parent process to immediately attempt to kill all the children. 
of its own. So all the uh, children process is currently handling any web requests. This might take some time because there might, might be a large number of web requests going on at the uh, same time. And finally, the parent itself exits. So you've successfully terminated not only the parent web server, which is responsible for forking or spawning all the child process, but all the web service functionality using Apache on your machine. This also means that requests in progress are terminated, so even if there was an outstanding request from a client to a web server, uh, the uh, client will never get a response from you. Uh, there's another signal called hop or hang up, which uh, indicates to the Apache web server that, that it should restart. So uh, this also causes it to kill off the children like a term, but this means the parent doesn't exit. But we use this to force the Apache web server to reread the configuration files. So for example, if we changed something, we added uh, an additional website to our configuration, or we added some security settings in configuration and so on. It reopens log files. So this is a way to restart your web server without having to really completely terminate and start it from scratch and to ensure that it rereads its own configuration file. Now, uh, for many uh, Unix processes, there are so-called user-defined signals, and usually there are at least two user-defined signals in a typical Unix system, user1 and user2. And here, uh, Apache defines a handler for user1, so this is a graceful restart. So this means that we want to restart our web server, but not by killing off all running connections, but then Apache asks its child processes, please, uh, after you've finished uh, talking to your current client, please terminate your connection or uh, exit immediately if you're not doing anything. And then the parent continues like with hang up before. So signals are a very simple way to communicate very minimal information. So essentially just the information that something has happened. And there's a finite number of symb uh, signals. For example, uh, signals are usually stored as single bits in a machine word. So for example, many Unix systems only implement 32 si uh, uh, signals because each signal is stored as a single bit in a, an int variable in your process control block if required. Uh, which means that, well, you're, you're out of signals when you reach 32 different signals. And this also means that several different signals can be outstanding at the same time. So if two processes send a signal to a process that is ready but not running, then both signals uh, are recorded by the operating system and can be delivered later. So uh, what other communication methods are actually available in Unix systems? Now, one you've already seen used on the shell are Unix pipes. So Unix pipes are channels between two communicating processes. Unix pipes are unidirectional. So we always have a sending process that sends out messages and a receiving process that receives this information. Unix pipes can have buffers, usually a fixed buffer size. They have a reliable transport. So this means that if a sender sends out data, as long as the receiving process is existing, then it receives this data unchanged and in the same order. And it's stream oriented, so we just send a stream of bytes or a stream of characters. So for Unix pipes, we have two general basic operations. One is read, so our receiving process reads from a pipe, whereas our sending pro process obviously sends from a pipe. And we've seen the order of sent characters is maintained. So we have a character stream and uh, we have a limited buffer here in our pipe between sender and receiver. So whenever our sender sent a large number of characters and our receiving process is slow to read them, then our pipeline will fill up. And as soon as it's filled up, our sending process will actually block at the right to the pipe uh, when the pipe is full. On the other hand, when the receiver process tries to read something from the pipe and the sender hasn't sent anything yet, uh, our receiving process blocks also and waits until data arrives from the sender. Now in Unix, you have two different types of ty uh, pipes. So on the one hand, you have unnamed pipes and you can create them using the pipe system call. So pipe gets past an integer array of two file descriptors. So we haven't talked intensely about files yet. We'll do this in a bit in an upcoming lecture. So essentially that means uh, you have communication going on uh, using file descriptors, but both file descriptors actually uh, describe uh, just different sides of the same pipeline. So they're not 
actually two different files. So after you have invocated the pipe system call, what's returned in your file descriptor, because this array here, you know, is just a pointer to the start of the array fdes. So your operating system puts in two file descriptors, so two integer values for file descriptors into that array. And uh, by convention, the file descriptor at array position zero is the one you can read from the pipe. So when you do a read system call, you would read from fdes of zero, whereas when you write to the pipe, you would use fdef, fdes of one, so the second element of our array. Uh, now, of course, the problem is when you use pipe, well, you have two file descriptors for both ends of the pipeline in one process. This doesn't make too much sense because then the process would only talk to itself. So after you created a pipe, then you have to pass one end, so usually the receiving end of your pipe, to another process, to that process you want to communicate with. And usually, as shown on the next slide, you do this by forking after creating the pipe. So you have two processes and remember, both share the same I.O. channels, including our file descriptors for the pipe. So then uh, we can differentiate between parent and child process. So the parent can, for example, write into that pipe, whereas the child can read from the other file descriptor here. You can also have so-called named pipes in Unix. So uh, named pipes are represented as a special file in your file system. So uh, you call MK FIFO. So this indicates the type of this pipeline again. So FIFO first in, first out is of course, the same semantics we get with unnamed pipes. So the thing you send in first into the pipeline is the first thing falling out at the other end of the pipeline. So MK FIFO gets a parameter to a path name, which uh, was created as a special file using the so-called MK not Unix command. And we can also add a mode here. So uh, when we, uh, after we called MK FIFO, we can actually use this file and this file is available, of course, in the file system, so other processes can see it. We can use this using the standard Unix file calls, open, read, write, and close, to read and write data from that name pipe or FIFO. And in order to ensure that only uh, yeah, certain processes can access information on that name pipe, you can use the usual Unix file access permissions, for example, read and write permissions to that FIFO in order to control uh, which processes can access data inside of that, yeah, essentially a virtual file, which is represented somewhere as a buffer in your operating system. So this is a bit of an example piece of code for using Unix pipelines. So what we do here is we create an enum just so we know that read, the read file descriptor is always at index zero of our file descriptor array, and our write file descriptor is always at index one. So when we start our program, we declare our array of two file descriptors. File descriptors are just integers. And uh, then we call our pipe call. Now, if this pipe call returns zero, then everything's perfect. So our pipe could be created. Uh, afterwards, uh, we fork our process. So we have a parent and a child process. So in our parent process, when we return, we get a return value of larger than zero. What we do is we want to write from our parent to our child process. So we close the reading side of our pipeline. So the FD of index zero here. And then we do something which is a bit strange. We use a Unix call called dub2. And this means that we actually copy a file descriptor to another file descriptor. So dub2 copies our standard output file descriptor one to the file descriptor for writing into the pipe. What this achieves is that everything we write, for example, using printf to our standard out, uh, arrives not on the screen anymore, but it arrives yeah, in the pipeline, in the input of the pipeline, which means instead of writing to the screen with printf, we write to our pipeline with printf. And then we can close the original file descriptor because we've duplicated the write file descriptor to our standard out file descriptor. And then uh, we could execute a writer process or we could use the parent process as writer process as we want. Uh, but let's assume we execute it because that has some uh, a special functionality we see on the next slide. On the other hand, if we're the child process, we close the other end of the pipeline. So we're only reading from that pipeline, not writing to it. Essentially, uh, what we're doing here is we then duplicate our 
read file descriptor. So the end of the pipeline where data comes out into standard in. So into the standard input, we would uh, read when we use uh, get s or scan f or something like that. Then we can close the original file descriptor and then we can execute another process. So a different one, obviously. So here's the first parameter passed on the command line. Here's the second one passed on the part of pipe, uh, on the command line. And we can execute a reader process. So after we executed this connect C program, giving two program names as parameters, one writer as the first parameter and a reader as the second parameter, what happens is we set up a connection between a writer here and a reader. So whenever our writer writes something using standard out into that pipeline, it automatically arrives at standard input for our reader. And so we have connected the first process, the output of the first process to the input of the second process, which means we have set up successfully a communication channel between both. So whenever the first process writes something into the pipeline, the second one is going to read it uh, when it executes a read call or similar. Now, this is also the trick our shell uses when it creates a shell pipeline. So when we execute this, compile and execute this program and say connect lswc, we would first as the first parameter actually call our ls command. And the output of ls, which usually outputs to standard out to, to your terminal, is redirected to the input of your word count command. So this actually corresponds to your shell command ls pipe wc. And that's exactly the way your shell implements such a pipeline. So for all processes participating in that pipeline, it does this redirection of standard input, standard output as required, and then it executes all of these processes. So it forks itself the shell uh, a number of times. So how many processes, depending on how many processes are participating in the pipeline, you can have longer pipelines connecting more processes. And in each of these fork child processes, then it executes a process with redirected I.O. And when we start this here, so we have this direction content here. When we use connect lswc, we see that the output of our ls is no longer appearing on the screen, but it's directly piped to word count. And word count then counts uh, the number of lines uh, and the number of characters here. But of course, there are additional ways in Unix to communicate. So there's actually a large number of different approaches for communication that have been developed over the year. Pipelines were a very early form of interprocess communication uh, implemented already in the mid of the 1970s, but more advanced methods of communication were required for more complex tasks later on. One of these are so-called Unix message queues. A Unix message queue actually is identified using a so-called key, which is just a unique address, which is unique per computer. So just an integer, which is unique. And this indicates not a process, but it indicates a certain queue that process can attach to. So a Unix message queue can have access permissions, which are the same as for files. And a Unix message queue can have a process local number. So each process that attaches to such a message queue gets a so-called message queue ID. And this is required for all operations. So when you want to send or receive data using a Unix message queue, you have to provide this message queue ID you've obtained when attaching to it. Unix message queues are undirected M to N communication. So you can have M senders and a different number of N, both equal or greater than one receivers. And uh, you can communicate using these queues. So everything that you sh uh, send in at one end of the queue arrives at the other end at all readers here. Unix message queues are buffered and the buffer size can be configured per queue. And in Unix message queues, uh, messages actually are typed. So a message has a long value as parameter, which indicates the type of the message. And so a receiver can actually, for example, uh, choose to only receive messages of a certain type if it's not interested in any other messages communicating over message queues. Operations to send and receive messages over Unix message queues can be blocking or non-blocking, but not asynchronous. And uh, because we have a message type here, a uh, receiver can choose to receive all messages or it can receive only the specified type indicating, indicated by this long value here. So this is a 
a simple graphical representation of Unix message queues. So we're all inside of one computer here. And then we have a message queue indicated by a key for this message queue. We have processes attaching to this message queue and they get their message queue identifiers back here. So that would be one, that would be three, and that would be two for these processes here, for example. So we have three processes uh, participating in that message queue. And in our example, process one and three actually send data to our message queue. And these are queued in order that the messages, uh, message queue and calls, the right calls to our message uh, queue actually occur. And then, at the other hand, our reader can actually read messages from the queue using its own message queue ID here. So, of course, we also have a system call interface for message queues. So, when you want to create a message queue and get a related message queue ID, uh, there's a call message get. So, you pass this unique key for the system wide message queue. Uh, here as key parameters and you can pass a flag. Uh, so all communicating processes need to know this key in order to attach to this message queue. Keys are unique in one system, so in one operating system instance. And when a key has already been assigned, you cannot create a message queue with the same key unless you reboot the system, obviously. Uh, you can also create keyless message queues, which are so-called private queues with a key uh, having a special uh, number of IPC private. Uh, so these are actually persistent, so they're not automatically deleted. Uh, and uh, if you want to delete a message queue explicitly, uh, then you can do it with a message control system call here. So when you want to send a message to your message queue, use a message send system call, which gets passed a message queue ID a pointer to a buffer containing your message, a size T indicating the size of your message, so you can have variable size messages, and you can have a message flag. And the first element in this buffer here, your message pointer points to is actually indicating the type of the message, and the remaining bytes of your message up to message size bytes contain whatever payload you use in your message. On the other hand, when you want to receive a message, there's a message receive system call. So here you have to allocate a buffer in advance and pass a pointer to that buffer here. Uh, you indicate the maximum size of that buffer. And here you can indicate as this message type parameter, which messages you're interested in. And if this message type is zero, you're just in in interested in the first message that arrives. If this message type is larger than zero, you're interested in the first message with a type you have passed here as message type. And if you pass a message type uh, uh, less than zero, then you would be interested in the message with the smallest type that's less or equal to the yeah, absolute value of message type. So you just negate this message type you passed, and then you check for the smallest type that actually has arrived, if this is the case. Since message queues are system-wide entities, you can actually use Unix shell commands to display all message queues in the system using the IPCS command dash Q. And if you want to get rid of a message queue, you can actually also manu manually delete them using the IPC RM uh, shell command with uh, dash capital Q, and then pass the key of that message queue as parameter. Now, uh, even if you have used Unix for some years, you might have never heard about Unix message queues. And the reason for this is that they're actually rarely used today, but they're an interesting example of typed messages with arbitrary lengths. That's why we showed them. So today in networked Unix systems, usually a different kind of inter-process communication is used more and more. And this is called sockets, uh, as we show in the next section, because sockets can communicate within a local system as well as between different computer systems on a network, whereas Unix message queues are constrained to communicating between processes on a single system only. Uh, in addition, when uh, Unix message queues are not available outside of Unix usually, and also maybe not in every Unix system you might encounter, so the related application code, if you write in a Unix application using message queues, might not actually work on all systems uh, you want to port your application to.